I'm Tiffany Sharp. I'm an attorney here in Sacramento. I'm also an entrepreneur myself, but uh, really my focus is on um, helping underrepresented women uh, be empowered to and through entrepreneurship. Uh, I've done a lot of work internationally in that space, and over the past few years I've really focused on women um, of color here in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And I know usually, you know, your background is immigration yeah. law, but now you are transitioning into a different kind of law. Can you right. tell me about that? Absolutely. So I've been doing immigration law uh, and working in, in the immigration advocacy space since uh, shortly after 2000, September 11th. Uh, in. Uh, uh, September 11th and in 2001 and um, really I feel like there's a lot of uh, cohesion in, in working in cannabis and working in immigration. We're talking about working with populations that have been underrepresented, populations that need representation um, locally, uh, statewide and federally and um, you know, populations that, when they're successful, really contribute to the economic success of their community. So it's really a natural transition. Uh, I, I love doing the immigration work in my clients. Um, and as a side, because I had other uh, entrepreneurial enterprises, I started noticing just some of the challenges that women um, in, in the entrepreneurial business space have, have been facing locally and internationally and five years ago started a nonprofit to work specifically with women to help empower them to and through entrepreneurship. Uh, and that um, organization, Willow Tree Roots, we started a program in Sacramento called The Power of She, which is an entrepreneurial incubator for women of color. And it was actually through that um, through that entrepreneurial incubator that I started to see that a lot of women of color in the program were interested in starting cannabis or cannabis related businesses and really had no you know, no idea where to go, where the laws were, what they needed. It's such a complicated space uh, just to work in anyway as uh, legally as a business. And then you add the components of being a woman, being a woman of color. I really felt that there was a need to focus advocacy in those areas to be of service to, to my community in that manner. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Woke Hanna. Yes. So Woke Canna is the company that I've formed in response to uh, the women of color that have come to me asking for business advice, legal advice in the, cannab in the legal uh, cannabis or legal marijuana um, entrepreneurial space. And so uh, I formed this company to specifically address the needs of, of women of color uh, in, in cannabis. Woke Canna stands for women of color uh, in cannabis. So that's, um, that's our primary focus and really focusing on the various aspects, legal advocacy, you know, legal advocacy, representation, but also business, you know, the developing the business skills that are absolutely necessary to be successful in any business with an approach and a sensitivity toward being a woman, being a woman of color, and being in a space that um, in, the, in the legal marijuana and the legal cannabis space uh, that isn't necessarily um, as friendly to women as you would think it is. And then you start talking about the added component of being a person of color, uh, particularly considering the history of marijuana prohibition. Um, I felt that that was you know, really where, where the focus should be. And women of color entering this space, you know, being a woman, being of color, being in the cannabis industry, these are all areas that really need special attention in order to ensure that women are gonna be successful. Yes. What is the, I guess, the goal of holding these community forums? Yes. So the first one we had um, uh, was uh, a few months ago, and um, it's when I first started Woke Canna and wanted to hold a community forum about, you know, educating, introducing uh, myself in that space because there is still a lot of stigmatization surrounding cannabis, marijuana, marijuana use, marijuana as a business, particularly in our communities of color. And so I wanted to hold this event to show that, you know, I'm a professional, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm a mother, I'm a business owner, and you can operate within the cannabis uh, and legal marijuana space, uh, you know, with dignity and pride, uh, and and start opening the you know opening up these conversations about how we can be profitable in this industry. So we held this you know organized this event. Really didn't wasn't sure 
uh, what was going to happen or where it was going to go. And over time, it developed into a really great um, educational seminar. We talked about the history of marijuana prohibition, talked about some of the obstacles women face. Uh, we had some you know, women of color entrepreneurs um, that are already in cannabis, like my Isha, come and, be, and sit on a panel to help really inspire and encourage women who want to get into that space. Like this, it is absolutely possible. We had representatives from the city come out and talk about you know, what they're looking at as far as the legality um, issues of it. And um, really to find out, you know, where, what are the concerns, what are the needs? And it turned out to be an absolutely wonderful, wonderful event, um, you know, intro an introduction of, of, of being a woman of color in business in cannabis. Um, so that was a few months ago, and that was really fantastic. As it's progressed, um, you know, and things, you know, we start seeing what, 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 what the needs are um, and what's necessary for advocacy. Uh, we're having an event on, on uh, December 11th, again at Brick House um, Art Gallery, where we're gonna be asking the community, not just women of color, but communities of color in general, and all of the community to come in and talk about what, what their needs and concerns are as um, communities of color that want to work in the cannabis space also that um, are having you know cannabis businesses in their neighborhood to present those before the city council prevent those present those before the city so that would be a direct community voice um, of advocacy as far as what is needed going forward in this legal in this legal industry so can you take us through a brief history yeah of <laughs> prohibition and how that plays into what we Rose, yeah. Much take it over. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll try to keep it brief because it is a you know long history going back um, almost a hundred years. Um, really, you can you can focus the beginnings of marijuana prohibition uh, in the 1930s after alcohol prohibition failed. Bureaucrats were really looking for something for for, for something else to place their focus on and um, and used marijuana that was being brought over from. Uh, from from you know being brought up from Mexico and um, and the Caribbean you know the Caribbean islands um, and used this this natural plant as a means and a method by which to uh, essentially persecute communities of color as a, as the policies were racist and xenophobic and and it's pretty pretty clearly stated um, in these policies the whole reason it's called marijuana the whole reason we use the word marijuana is because it was specifically focused on the spanish sounding name of the plant versus cannabis and i'll i'll go to talk i'm going to touch it on that later because now we call it cannabis um, and it's really a whitewashing of the history of marijuana prohibition uh, but they you know the, the the name marijuana really comes from that desire of bureaucrats to focus on the foreignness of the of the plant and to strike fear uh, in the community um, against um, you know, black and brown communities. It was a racist and xenophobic policy um, that was implemented. You know, you talk, they, they, they call it the devil weed and, and, and you start looking, um, at, you know, videos like Reefer Madness were put out about all of the false uh, consequences of, a, of, of marijuana consumption. Things like, you know, if, if white women consume marijuana, they're going to want to start having sexual relations with black men. They use this, you know, these these fears um, to to not only make the drug illegal or the plant illegal, but also to persecute black and brown populations. Um, and that really has uh, moved forward through history again, almost a hundred years. Uh, only half the states now have decriminalized or legalized it to some extent. So we're still seeing the effects of this. Um, and it really uh, has moved through time. The Nixon administration, when the Controlled Substance Act was being, um, was being formed, the Nixon administration actually commissioned um, uh, the Schaefer Commission to do a study on marijuana to find out, does it have any medical benefits? How dangerous is it? Where should it be placed 
in the schedules of controlled substance. And the Schaefer Commission actually came out and said, you know, the, the Nixon's, own, Nixon's own commission um, that, that he formed, they said there are, there are a lot of medical benefits and it's not harmful. And even though his own commission uh, came out with these results, they still place it as a Schedule One substance, which is the most, uh, you know, the most harmful and regulated substance. Cocaine is a Schedule Two, to give you some perspective. Um, and so, marijuana is still a Schedule One substance. It, to just again, to give you some perspective, we are still not there yet. We are still suffering the consequences of of these. Um, but again, the Nixon administration um, was using this, you know, the, these policies to. Uh, really subjugate and incarcerate black and brown populations. Moving through again through history, we start talking about the Reagan administration and the war on drugs. Um, the war on drugs really uh, and, and mandatory sentencing really is where we start to see a lot of black and brown populations, uh, primarily men, being incarcerated and, and, and receiving um, just in, in exorbitant criminal sentences, incarceration rates skyrocketed, criminal sentences uh, times skyrocketed based on these policies of mandatory sentencing and the war on drugs. Again, understanding uh, marijuana is scheduled uh, as a more dangerous, less beneficial drug than cocaine. Um, and so again, this is moving through, moving through history. This is not too long ago. Um, some of people that are my age, we remember, we remember this time. So this is not, we're not talking about ancient history. Um, and even now, you know, we, when we're talking about the consequences of this, here in California it's legal, but the consequences are still, still being felt. During the war on drugs and during these exorbitant incarceration rates, um, you know, black and brown men were, were taken out of, of our communities and placed in prison. That's a whole, you know, generations of economic um, capabilities that have been stripped away from communities and, they're, and we're continuing to suffer from these. Uh, people that had simple possession charges that lost their custody of their kids, um, couldn't get jobs, and they're, you know, snowball, the snowball effect of, of, of these sentences, and we're still seeing them as a consequence today. There are still people in jail whose first conviction was for simple possession. So we're talking about um, an industry, a profitable industry, the cannabis industry, uh, where people are making money legally, where there are still people sitting in jail for marijuana. Um, and we're talking about the same substance, we're talking about the same plant. And so that's why it's really important for us when we're talking about marijuana legalization, cannabis legalization, however you wanna, however you wanna call it, um, and the business, we cannot forget how we got to be where we are today. And that is really off of the, the backs of black and brown communities. What sorts of, I guess, policies or programs need to be in place yes. in order to, I guess, for lack of a better word, I guess, amend mm -hmm. um, all of those conviction yeah. in light of where we're at today. Yes. So the core program in Sacramento is fantastic as a fantastic start. It's a fantastic um, starting block for where we need to go moving forward. What the core program does and, and it's been implemented based on the hard work of a lot of community advocates um, and 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 a lot of respect and homage needs to be to, to be paid to this space. Um, and so it's a great start. We need to continue and move forward. What the core program offers is um, applicants and, and equity uh, participants an opportunity to learn the industry itself um, and how and and how to be successful in the industry. What we need to do going forward is give. Um, the core participants, the tools to implement that success. So for example, um, there is no startup funding available. Um, the startup costs alone is at least 50,000. Again, that's before you even start making profits in. So let's think about this. You've got um, communities who have lost generational wealth, um, who have lost generational wealth because uh, because people have been, in, you know, spent time in prison and jail. These are, this is generational wealth that is that has been lost, and we're asking them to 
you know, pony up at least fifty to one hundred thousand uh, dollars just to start a business. So that's a challenge. That's not very few people can 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 meet that challenge. And so what's needed is you know these profits. Um, and listen, the prison industry is a profitable industry. That's a topic for a different day. But um, the prison the 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 the, the prison industry is itself profitable. We need to take some of those profits that the prison industry has received, that the um, city has received, and money that the city has, and use that to correct the injustices that have been uh, placed upon communities of color because of the war on drugs, because of marijuana, um, because of marijuana prohibition. And so things like startup funding, um, some real calls to, to action, you know, when core participants finish, their program. They need to be able to start a business. Um, if they prove that they are, you know, viable in their business plan and they have a plan for sustainability, then they need to be offered startup funding. Okay. And so when you think about this, just, uh, and, and this needs to come, I think, in my opinion and in the opinion, opinion of many others, this needs to come from the city. Because when you're asking, you know, for people to obtain private funding, um, people of color are less likely to receive funding uh, in general, private equity, fun you know, venture startup funding, private equity funding. Um, and then you start talking about women, right? Women in general receive less than 1% of any funding. And you start talking about women of color, that's even less. And, um, and I really focus on women of color because, again, you're talking about a population uh, where a lot of male community members were incarcerated. Who's left in the community when that happens? It's the women. It's the women that continue to sustain the community, that continue to um, try to make the community run, that take care of the community, have been running the businesses, whether they be uh, legal or unauthorized at the time, continuing to do this. And so, uh, you know, women, in my opinion, are really in a good position to, to continue the sustainability of success. But being that we're less likely to receive funding, there needs to be some funding provided. Um, in addition, there needs to be, you know, continued access to resources, mentorship, um, opportunities, uh, you know, reduced licensing fees all across the board, greater opportunities for things like property. It's expensive as all get out to get into the legal marijuana industry, right? Um, and so that's why you see a lot of out of uh, out of out of out of city, out of state, out of country investors coming in because it takes a lot of money, and none of these profits are going back into our communities. So, um, so these are some of the things that we need moving forward. We're having our event on December 11th to actually find out what, in addition to the things that we know need to be done, what are some other things that the community needs. Yes. So, um, you know, if you talk about just women in general in business, even the World Bank has done studies. And in my uh, other nonprofit, you know, working with women, uh, underrepresented women entrepreneurs, this has been the case. Women in general, when we make money, we turn that right straight back into the community. We make sure that our children are receiving education. We make sure that our children are receiving proper medical and health care. We make sure that the environment is cared for. We're better stewards of the, our community around us. We make sure that we hire from within our community. We, we hire people that look like us. Um, we implement policies that are fair and equitable and community-based, okay? So it, women in general, um, are more likely to turn those profits right back into the community. When you're talking about women of color, so if you're talking about an industry um, that has stripped away so much generational wealth um, through the incarceration and, and, and illegalization, if the government's not going to implement social policies to put that wealth back into the community, then we need to look to the, the women of that community because that's how you get 
those resources to repair the damage that's been done and to lift up those communities. You know, Maisha was talking about some of the things that she wants to do. This is, she's a perfect example of what you see when you empower women economically, when you empower women of color economically. Her first inclination is when I become successful, I'm gonna bring everybody else with me. Um, and so that's why I think it's important, particularly when we're talking about this industry and repairing the, the systematic damage, the loss of generational wealth, the loss of um, companionship and family, the emotional toll it's taken on a community, the, the mental toll it's taken on a community, the health toll it's taken on a community. I really think women of color within those community are going to be the best sustainable source for, for implementing these uh, reparative and restorative policies. So, um, what is it like um, being um, in Sacramento cannabis industry <laughs> as a black woman? I know you told me some stories. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so first, before you get into that, like, are, I, I, I already know the answer, but yeah. are there a lot so no, but there's not a lot of us um, in the space that are up and running and out in front. That does not mean that there are not women of color who want to get into this space. You know, we had this event at Brick House, this first event a few months ago, and um, I mean, re to, to be perfectly honest, I organized it and I was going to have it in the conference room of my office. I thought, okay, maybe 20 women show up, we'll just have a conversation. And I posted this event and within an hour, 20 women registered. By the end of, you know, by the time the day came, we had 300 women registered and another 500 that were on a waiting list. So this is what this tell, and, and the line was out the door. This is what this means. This is, means that there are women that want to get into this industry, but they don't know how, they're afraid to or they're concerned about the social stigmatization surrounding being a woman of color in business. Our own communities, we still have a lot of stigmatization stemming from the prohibition, stemming from you know, everybody telling us it's wrong, you're gonna go to jail, you shouldn't be doing this. That still, is, that still circulates throughout our community even when it comes down to um, medicinal and therapeutic use and so what we need to do is beat down that stigmatization you know because the white community is all about enjoying CBD out in the open and touting the benefits the therapeutic benefits that they receive we're still a little bit reserved about doing that because we have been so heavily incarcerated and penalized um, for doing that and just even socially within our own community there you know in some aspects it's frowned upon and so it's not that women of color in Sacramento don't want to get into the industry. We need to allow that space and tell them that it's okay to be in this industry, even if you aren't directly related, you know, directly contacting the plant. There is business to be had and there's business to be done ancillarily. So legal services, marketing services, accounting services, um, you know, security services, ATM services. There's a lot of things that women of color can do in cannabis business uh, to, uh, to, to benefit from these profits that aren't directly related. And even if they are directly related, you know, at these events that I've held and the speaking um, engagements that I've held, you know, women that want to get into it, they want to they get into making therapeutic products and talking about how it's going to help some of the um, emotional trauma that we of a community have suffered throughout the years. They want to use it beneficially and therapeutically. And so there is a, there is a high demand, there's a high want to get into the industry. We need as a community to create space to say it's okay to do that. And in fact, this is our entitlement. Um, this, is, this, is, this is our right to be in this space because this space exists because of us. <laughs> Besides, you know, the money yeah. aspect of it, just what is the environment like when you go to a cannabis yes. or marijuana event? I have to tell you, you know, and I'm in a lot of diff spaces where um, I am the only black woman in the room or I'm the only person, per black, you know, black woman or man or woman in the room. I've been in a lot of these spaces. And, um, and so 
but I was shocked uh, when I started going to, you know, main sort of mainstream cannabis industry events at how uh, how sexist and racist the industry can be still, and it's not. I think that that's something that the mainstream doesn't want to talk about and they don't want to address because you know there's some responsibility uh, now that it's mainstream that needs to be had and it's easy to ignore that because it's it doesn't it doesn't nobody wants to take that up um, but but you see it when you walk into these spaces so I was actually surprised and shocked at how how racist and how sexist um, the industry is and and I know I'm going to catch a lot of flack for saying that but that's the truth um, I've gone to events and um, you know, explain to people uh, that I'm getting a cannabis law certificate and, and my purpose for wanting to do so. And having people question, you know, why I want to do that, what's, you know, the pros and cons of reparations or why we shouldn't be doing reparations or why, um, how I need to present myself uh, in front of my own constituents, women of color. This is white men telling me how I need to be to advocate for women of color. So you get that you get the mansplaining, you get the white mansplaining that you get um, as a woman in general, but there's sort of this entitlement um, that this is their space and you're in their space and let me tell you how to do this. When in fact, this space again exists because of us. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people of color, I know a lot of women of color, um, who just refuse to go to these because it is such a difficult space to be in because it, there is so much racism, there is so much sexism um, that exists and because it's sort of a sexy industry to be in now, we're not, you know, nobody wants to look at the, the uncomfortable parts of this industry. Um, and so that's why I show up and, uh, you know, people need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and show up to these spaces because again, if we don't, step into these spaces and use our voices to advocate what's going to happen is our history uh, is going to be forgotten. Our history of how we came to be here is going to be forgotten. You know, the history of, of black and brown culture that gets um, swept up by the mainstream white community and it forgets where it stems from. That's what's going to happen with, with, with legalized marijuana, legalized cannabis. Um, and so we need to start having these conversations. We need to start calling people out. We need to start stepping into these spaces and saying, you know, uh, no, let me tell you how you need to be in this space because you're here in this space because you know my community my family is allowed you know advocated for you to be in this space um, and so yeah it's quite challenging and there's been times and I'm pretty vocal about it you know when I first got into it I thought this is gonna be fun we're gonna be in mar legalized marijuana this is gonna be great this is gonna be so much fun and um, you know, I go to these events and come home just really disappointed and almost, you know, to a certain extent devastated because the, the racism and sexism that being a black woman in the legal industry is nothing compared to the racism and sexism of being a black woman, a woman of color in the legal cannabis industry.